Good morning. It is a privilege to be with you this morning and to continue our time of worship together as this local congregation. I would uh, call you to open up your copy of God's Word to the little epistle of 3 John. 3 John. If you're not sure where to find it, you can start at the very end, Revelation, and go back two little books, Jude and then 3 John. 3 John is where we'll be today, and for those of you that were with us last week, we were uh, there, kind of have jumped out of our, our uh, look at Luke's gospel for a couple of weeks to focus our attention specifically on this particular area of hospitality, as I've uh, titled this little mini-series, uh, Hospitality 101, and uh, I'm not very clever, so last week was the good, and this week is the bad, so uh, hopefully that's uh, something that you can track with. And uh, today as we gather together, I wanted to take a brief moment, uh, those of you that came yesterday to the, the seminar on evangelism, uh, that was just a, a really blessed opportunity to, to come together. We had close to 70 people over in our sanctuary, um, taking a day to see what the Word of God says about evangelism. And I would just encourage you that... Um, if you are not a part or haven't been a part of uh, local outreach ministries here at our church, we're in a uh, period right now where we are growing that. There's some new community outreach ministries that are being formed and developing. And so we would love to have you be a part of that. Um, a date to put on the calendar for you is October 6th. So that'll be our next neighborhood outreach. So after church, Sunday afternoon, if you would love to join us. We'll go door to door to meet our neighbors and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. If you've never done that and it's scary, guess what? I'm scared every time I walk up to a door. Um, but the good news is that I have the good news. I don't have a product to sell. I have a glorious um, gospel to give. And so it's a, a beautiful thing. Just would encourage you to come join us and be a part of that. And there will be other options and opportunities uh, ahead as well. All right, 3 John is where we uh, find ourselves. And I want to just begin by reading this letter, um, verse 1, all the way through 15, and then praying once again. And we will jump into our study today of Hospitality 101, the bad. 3 John, if you're there, say I'm there. Good, thank you. We read, The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. For I was very glad when brethren came and testified to your truth. That is how you are walking in truth. I have no greater joy than this to hear of my children walking in the truth. Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers, and they have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God, for they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. I wrote something to the church but Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. For this reason, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does, unjustly accusing us with wicked words and not satisfied with this. He himself does not receive the brethren either, and he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God, and the one who does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself, and we add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. I had many things to write you, but I'm not willing to write them to you with pen and ink, but I hope to see you shortly, and we will speak face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for the privilege it is that we can come and assemble and gather in your name, that we can come to your word that you have given by way of inspiration, the authoritative, inerrant, infallible, sufficient word of God. We thank you, Lord, that you want to speak with us this morning and you've done so through the text that we encounter today. 
I ask that you would give clarity to our minds that they might be opened, that we would understand this passage before us, but it would be more than just intellectual understanding, that it would take root even down to our hearts, that our affections would be raised, that our desires would be strengthened and exhorted and encouraged, and that it would go even beyond that, that it would go from the mind to the heart and ultimately to the will, that we'd be transformed by what we find here. Lord, help us to to heed the warning in this passage. Help us to be faithful followers of Christ who are biblically hospitable, who love to be involved with the support and ministry of the gospels that goes forth, Lord, in our community and around the globe. Thank you for this little book of 3 John, and thank you for the time we have to study it this morning. Lord, please speak to us powerfully and transform us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. On the night of September 7th, 1986, there were two Soviet Soviet ships that collided in the Black Sea off the coast of Russia. One of the ships was an ocean liner carrying 1,234 passengers. The other was a freight ship carrying a cargo of oats. Within 15 minutes of this collision, the ocean liner was disappearing below the waves, it had sunk and 398 passengers died in the icy and frigid waters of the Black Sea. This is a horrible tragedy, a horrible tragedy that only gets worse when you learn why. News of the disaster was darkened later on after the event when an investigation revealed the cause of the accident. And it wasn't caused by technology problems. There wasn't a malfunction of the radar. It wasn't caused by weather problems. The seas weren't rough. uh, The fog wasn't dense. The cause was actually found to be human stubbornness. Pride. Each captain was actually aware of the other ship, its presence nearby. In fact, they knew that their ships were on a collision course for 45 minutes. And both could have steered clear, but according to the news reports, neither captain wanted to give way to the other. And what was proved to be a very dangerous case of chicken, neither captain One, they both lost, and so did 398 humans and their families. Is there any more devastating sin than pride? Is there any more destructive expression of pride than what we see in the selfish ambition that often accompanies it? You know what I mean. It's the me-centered, me-first, me-focused, self-promotion, self-seeking, egocentric kind that always wants to be exalted above others, even at times above God. I wish that this was a a rare occurrence. I wish that this story that I've begun with was was something that, that only happened once, but is it not true that as you think across the The annals of human history, we find that this has just happened over and over and over and over and over again. That this very issue of pride began even before human history. It began when Satan himself, at his fall, his sinful desires to ascend above the heights of the clouds to make himself like the most high, led to his downfall. When he sought to take for himself glory that was due to the creator. The pride didn't end with the devil. No pride made its way into human history and selfish, selfish ambition goes all the way back even to the garden. To, to a perfect place where Adam and Eve dwelt with God. And from the very beginning even there, Eve deceived by the serpent of old took the bait that Satan used, the temptation that God was in some way holding out. And if you look at that text in Genesis 3, you find that the temptation of the bait was, oh, Eve, you can be wise. In fact, it says, you can be like God. 
Scripture recounts the same story of selfish ambition and pride as I said over and over again. Whether it's Abimelech, the son of Gideon, who desires to be the king and murder 70 of his own brothers to ensure that there would be no rival. Or Absalom, the son of David, who took his place at the gates and staged a coup against his own father. Or King Uzziah, who in a desire to to be, as it says in the text of 2 Chronicles, when his heart became strong and proud. It was so proud that he acted, acted corruptly and took the position as a priest, the high priest that was not his, and sought to offer incense. We could go on, not even in, uh, among the people of the Jews, but even Haman, the great enemy of the Jews, whose pride was to such a height that he built a gallow for the destruction of his enemy and other and hung on the very same gallow. The pride of King Nebuchadnezzar that Daniel 4 mentions and talks about, the king of Babylon whose pride reached its zenith when he looked out upon the whole of his empire and boasted the pride of Herod Agrippa in the book of Acts when the people heard his speech and said, oh, not the words of a man, the words of a God. There are so many examples and instances of pride in the scriptures, yes, but let me, let me just say this. As you even think about this introduction, as you think about these words I've begun with, is it right to say that there's not myriad examples running through your mind in your own life, in the lives of others, where this very same selfish ambition and pride has wreaked havoc? The sin of pride and selfish ambition leaves an indelible mark upon our lives. It it may come through the pursuit of a promotion at work that goes beyond just doing your best and seeks to step on anyone and everyone to get ahead. It looks like for some of you school-age children, the yearning to be popular and in the in crowd to such a degree that you will say hurtful things about someone else. It's a demand for comfort and convenience. Some of you husbands, when you come home and put your feet up and demand of your wife a pride that says, I want to be comfortable at all costs rather than saying, I want to sacrifice myself for the sake of my wife and children. The pride that even makes its way into churches like this, a self-seeking kind of pride to carve out your own place of authority or power or ministry or prestige, not for the good of the people of God, but for the exaltation of your own self. Unfortunately, pride and selfish ambition are all too common. And I could preach this sermon in any church, in any place in the world, and it would apply. Sad to say, we're often oblivious to the the pattern of sin even in ourselves. I love what C.S. Lewis said. He once remarked, there's no fault which makes a man more unpopular and no fault which we are more unconscious of in ourselves, pride. And the more we have it ourselves, the more we dislike it in others. Some of you just caught that. It's true. Someone once said as well, pride's the only disease that makes everyone sick but the one who has it. In our passage today in 3 John, you know, we've already looked at the good last week. The example of Gaius, who we studied, a a man who exemplified a commitment to the truth. He was, as we said, a walker in the truth, a welcomer of the truth, a worker with the truth. And he was commended strongly by John for that. And now in our passage today, we get the flip side of the coin, the the other side of the contrast, contrast is as we're introduced to a case study in pride, uh, as I said in my Sunday school class, I don't know many people that name their son Diotrephes. And the reason why is because the example or the case study we see here is, is bad. It's the bad. It's horrendous. And, and I'd hazard a guess at times, sometimes we say, well, well, can't we just have the sermons about Gaius? <laughs> but I don't know about you, I need bad examples. That's why I'm the youngest of four children. I had three older siblings that I could learn from. And often I learned much more from their bad examples than I learned from their good. And if you're watching, Steph 
or Gord or Joe. I love you. <laughs> but God often does this with us. He knows that we need the, the difficult, the bad example to wake us up sometimes to the sin that exists in ourselves. And so let me just do this from the beginning. We're going to look at three verses in particular, verses 9, 10, and 11. And I just want to, I want to warn you that this is a warning passage. And so I want to warn you that, that the danger of this passage, as is the case so often when we think of negative examples, is for you to check out and for you to assume, oh, well, I'm not diatrophies. Pride is the only disease that makes everyone sick but the one who has it. Can I say this? If, if you don't recognize pride in yourself, you have it. And so this passage warns of that pride expressed in selfish ambition and the, the danger of that. We're going to look at three aspects of selfish ambition presented here in our passage. And we want to learn about this to be aware of ourselves, to seek out and root out this type of sin that may exist in us. Why? Because we want to be effective ministers of the gospel. And what we'll see is Diotrephes, Hospitality 101, the bad was, is that there was no hospitality. Why? Because of selfish ambition. So here's the reality. You will not obey God. You will not be hospitable to the ministry and support of the work of God if you do not recognize selfish ambition in yourself. Three Ds this morning, the danger of selfish ambition, the deeds of selfish ambition, and the dictum against selfish ambition. Verse 9, the danger. Look what John says. I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. As I mentioned last week, and I've already noted here, Third John is really a dramatic contrast between two characters. You have Gaius on the one hand, you have Diotrephes on the other and as we saw, the, the first Gaius was, was unselfish. He was a faithful man of God. His life was marked, as the text says, by a commitment to the truth. He was commended by John for his hospitality, his support of the work of ministry. He's the kind of guy that you want in your church. He's the kind of guy that loves the body of Christ and loves the word of God and loves to see the truth proclaimed and is willing to sacrifice of his own comforts and convenience, his own home, his own stuff, for the sake of others. That's Gaius. That's the first eight verses. It's glorious. But then it's like John's going along, and you're kind of like, John, yeah, like skip from you know, 8 to 12. Wouldn't that be great? But John has to say something here because there's another guy. And there's a lot of uh, discussion about whether this is, in the, is Diotrephes and Gaius in the same church or different churches. I believe that the text seems to indicate he's, they're in different churches. Uh, the reason why I would say that is because he says the first among them. He's speaking of a group. Not, he wouldn't say the first among you if it was speaking of the same group with Gaius. So I think it's two different churches. But it's a church that obviously Gaius is aware of. Diotrephes, he doesn't, John doesn't have to explain him. He doesn't say, oh, Diotrephes, this guy you don't know about. There's an assumption here that, that this guy's known. And John here now turns his attention to this character, Diotrephes. He doesn't tell us what he had wrote before. You notice here it says, I wrote something to the church. Um, I think there's enough here that would cause us to at least speculate that he had written something about ministering to itinerant missionaries coming in. Diotrephes, I've got a brother coming. I want you to care for him. Similar to what he's doing here with Gaius. But unfortunately, there's a church member there who didn't accept what was said. There's a church member there in that church from the start that did not accept the writings of the apostle. And from the very beginning, this should raise a red flag and this should sound warning bells, shouldn't it? From the very beginning, remember, this is the apostle John that's writing. This is the disciple whom Jesus loved. This is the one who is of the twelve, commissioned by our Lord to proclaim the gospel. He's the disciple left it's the near the end of the first century. The other 12 have all 
been martyred for the faith. He remains an arbiter of the truth, and he writes to this man, Gaius, and he says in this, I need to tell you something bad. I wrote to another church. I wrote to this man, Diotrephes. He, he doesn't accept what we say. He rejects the very authority of the Lord Jesus Christ through his apostles. Who Ephesians 2 says were raised up to be the foundation of the truth. Christ Jesus, the chief cornerstone of that truth. But, but, but why? Why did Diotrephes do this? Was it because the, maybe the instructions were too hard to swallow? Was it because Diotrephes was maybe confused on the issue? Maybe he misunderstood the instructions of John? Maybe the expectations were more than he could handle? No, no, you know what? The text tells us exactly why he did it. Look at it, verse 9. I wrote something to the church. Diotrephes, what's it say? Who loves to be first among them. It's a verb here. It's used in the present tense. It emphasizes the fact that this is the continual desire of Diotrephes. He loved to be first among them. This is the only place in Scripture where we find this verb, philoprotuon. It's made up, it's a compound word made up of two Greek words. It literally means loving the first. It means to love the position. It means to love the highest rank. It, it means to desire status and prestige. It's the very definition of pride and selfish ambition. To love to be first, to love to be primary. Someone once said this, Diotrephes is the father of a long line of sons who have not learned to distinguish between love for Christ and his church and love for their own place in it. I hope you love the church. I hope you love Christ. I hope you appreciate where God has brought you in this time and in this place. And I'm grateful. But I hope you never love the preeminence. I hope you're always willing to give it aside. See, Diotrephes wasn't. He loved his place in the church, but he wasn't just content with some prominence. He, was, he wanted it all. The King James says he desired to have the preeminence. And I like that word, and here's why. Because this is the only place that we find this verb. It's the only place in the New Testament that we find one loving to be first. But there is one other place where we have a related verb. It's not the same verb, but it's related. It's got the same root. And that place is found, we already heard it read this morning, in Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, as Bill, not Paul, read this morning. <laughs> the Apostle Paul's words, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that... Listen, all of that, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. The word there is the preeminence. There's only one who can have the preeminence in the church. There is only one chief cornerstone, and his name is not Diotrephes. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. There is only one who can be upon the throne, only one perfect son of God, only one creator and sustainer of all things who condescended to come in the flesh and dwell among us as a man. There's only one who lived a perfect sinless life that we could never live. 
and went to the cross and died on behalf of sinners like us. There's only one that was resurrected from the grave three days later, conquering Satan and sin and death. There is only one who has ascended into heaven and been exalted to the right hand of the Father so that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That deserves more than one amen. He alone has the preeminence. Not only is he alone the only one that deserves the preeminence, he alone is the only one who has the preeminence. And so what Diotrephes was doing in this case was usurping the very authority of Jesus Christ. He alone's the head of the church. Not Diotrephes. Not even the Apostle John, not me, not the elders, not this congregation, not any one of you in this room. Jesus Christ, don't ever forget it, is the great shepherd of the sheep and he alone deserves the preeminence. Do you see why this sin was so significant? Do you see why this selfish ambition is so, so dangerous? The greatest error in the text here is that Diotrephes, who seemed to have some position of authority, we don't know what. Maybe he was a pastor. Maybe he was a, a, a deacon or an elder. Maybe he was just a, a layman with some money. We don't know what it was, but there was something significant that gave him a place of, of some authority. Maybe he was just a smooth-talking man and was able to, to develop a following and he had enough prominence here and enough love for the preeminence that wasn't his that rather than submitting to the lordship of Jesus Christ and his apostles, he asserted his own wishes. Rather than shepherding the flock of God with a godly example, with eager, eagerness and gentleness, uh, as Gaius did, one who sought to, to obey and, and follow God's commands, he lorded it over those in his charge, and rather than following the example of Christ who didn't come to be served but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many, what did he do? Instead, he pursued his own interests. He sought to have the church serve him. Diotrephes had obviously never heard the lesson from John the Baptist that he must decrease, that Christ might increase. He obviously had never, maybe he was asleep when the sermon from Mark 10 was preached. In verse 42, when Jesus says, you know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great men exercise authority over them. But it's not this way among you, disciples. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man, implication here, who deserved to be served by all, did not come to be served but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. You know this truth. And some of you here, yeah, I've heard this before. Do you live it? What marks your life? Gaius? Gaius-like servanthood? Love for the brethren? Desire to see the gospel go forth, proclaimed, not a hinderer, but a helper? Or is it more like Diotrephes? Your kingdom, your wishes, your wants, your comfort, your convenience... By the way, you don't have to be an elder or a pastor to be like Diotrephes. Sure, the more authority that you have within a particular body or gathering, the more potential for abuse, but you can lord it over people in your home just as quickly, can't you? Some of you men are Diotrephes in your home. Some of you women are diatrophies in your relationships. We have to ask the hard question 
And notice something, by the way, here. I didn't say this, but it's interesting to note that John doesn't in any way evidence that Diotrephes had false teaching. You notice that? He highlighted so much the fact that Gaius was of the truth, it would make perfect sense that if this was an issue of heresy or false teaching, that he would say, and Diotrephes, who hates the truth, he doesn't. He doesn't say, and Diotrephes, who is teaching false doctrine, he doesn't say that because guess what? The issue here is not an issue of heresy, it's, it's hubris. It's pride. We can be doctrinally sound and spiritually destructive. We can know the word inside and out and have all of our doctrinal ducks in a row and we can abuse and beat people down with it at the same time and be just like Diotrephes. Lest we think that this is a danger beyond impacting us in this room, listen to the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 10. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. All of us need to consider and think and guard our own hearts, be aware of the subtle and sophisticated poison darts of our enemy because pride is one of his favorite. And he starts young and he starts subtly. Pride starts so often in an A-plus grade that comes home from school or a three-touchdown football game or a, wow, I really know the Bible answered a lot of those questions in Sunday school this morning. There is a danger of selfish ambition and pride. We see it here in Diotrephes. There's a second, though. Not only the danger, but the deeds. Look at verse 10, the deeds of selfish ambition. Therefore, he says in verse 10, for this reason, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does. Now, just note something here. John could not allow this selfish ambition to go. He, he, John didn't have to write about diatrophies, did he? He didn't have to. He could have just made this a, a really positive sermon. <laughs> but he does this because... He, he, he's not going to allow selfish ambition like this to go unchecked. See, the point is there's, a, there's, there's actually an interesting suggestion. Uh, one of the commentators, and I think he's right, as to why. Why specifically does John bring this up? I think in general it's because John recognizes that you can't let sin go. If you let sin go, it's only a matter of time that it takes root and that it will it will transgress more and more and more and become more problematic. But I think there's another reason. I think there's an incident in John's life that motivated him to address this head on. If you think back to the story of the Gospels, there's a point when Jesus is traveling from Jerusalem, or I'm sorry, traveling to Jerusalem. He's drawing near to the, the Passion Week, the point of his death. And they're walking on the road, and the text tells us that the disciples, meanwhile, are behind him discussing among themselves who would be greatest in the kingdom. And this author, John, his mama's there. And John and James, Mrs. Zebedee, comes up to Jesus, and she says, Hey, can you give a seat of prominence on the right and on your left? And Jesus replies with a rebuke, whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. He's gentle and kind and patient even to John and James, the sons of thunder. But John's experience was firsthand. Jesus pointed out so clearly, don't, don't go after the prominence. If you want to be one of my disciples, it's not going to be about sitting on my right or my left in this earthly kingdom. It's not going to be about what you can be exalted to in your own efforts. And that's not what it's about, John. And I think John, obviously, now decades later, the disciple whom Jesus loved, is, he's learned this lesson over and over and over again. And so John calls attention to this, not just to the motive and the attitude, but, but even more pointedly to the resulting effects. Because John realizes that sin left unconfronted 
doesn't go away. Can I say something as an aside here? If you know a brother or sister in our midst that's caught in sin and you ignore that, you hate your brother or sister. You hate them. But, but Pastor Aaron, it's really hard to confront somebody about their sin. Yeah, I know, it's hard. But that evidence is a hatred for them. Because if you would see them wallowing in the muck and the mud and the mire and leave them there, is that compassion and love? If you would leave them living in a manner that displeases your Lord and Savior because it's inconvenient for you or it might be a conflict or it might be difficult, that's hatred, not love. That doesn't mean we're around every corner with our eyeglasses out or our magnifying glass looking for the sin in everyone else. Matthew 7, Jesus has a point about that, doesn't he? Deal with a log in your own eye first, right? But I'm going to tell you, we live in a day and an age where far too often sin goes unaccounted for. Sin goes unconfronted. And that is damaging to you as individuals and damaging to the body of Christ as a whole. It wreaks havoc. So John says, I'm going to point out, for this reason, I'll call attention to his deeds. And then he says, here are the deeds. By the way, some people think, why? It's really, really bad when a pastor points out someone by name. Guys, the New Testament's full of pastors pointing out people by name and calling them out when they are going to have destruction that's going to harm others. He says, Diotrephes is doing something harmful to the church. And notice what happens here. Diotrephes had rejected the letter sent. Right? It's not a situation here in which his, his selfish ambition just stayed there, though, did it? Because sin never stays in one place. I've got a, a new house with yards to take care of. And when I bought the house, I thought that it was not going to have any weeds. Because there were no weeds when I went and looked at it. I assumed that the front yard and backyard would be weed-free. It was a weed-free house. I bought that house. I think it's bait and switch. They sent birds to drop weeds. You've got to be realistic. I know that's funny, but the reality is, no, of course I know that weeds have to be rooted out, taken care of pulled at the root, and the more I walk by my house every morning and say, oh, that weed's okay, next day, that weed's okay, next day, that weed's okay, next day, I need a backhoe to pull this thing out now. That sin in your life, that sin in the lives of your brethren, that sin in your children, parents, don't look, don't look aside gentleness, compassion, love, address it. John called attention to his deeds. And notice, he calls deeds by name. Look at this. He was slanderous. Look firstly what he says in verse 10. I'll call attention to his deeds, which he does, one, unjustly accusing us with wicked words. He was slanderous. The verb used here literally means to babble, to make, to make foolish or nonsensical utterances. That's what the word is. He, he's saying, uh, the ESV says that he was talking wicked nonsense against us. I like that translation because it's, it's as though he's not making sense. He's just, he's just upset that John's asked him to do something and it's impacting his potential realm of influence. And so he starts to, uh, well, well, let me tell you about John. And he's babbling. He's creating nonsense. He's slandering John. The accusations are in this text Wicked, but they're also baseless. There's no truth. Doesn't mean it doesn't hurt, does it? Anybody ever, ever been the, on the receiving end of wicked nonsense? I have. Accusations made against you that are absolutely not true and complete nonsense if anyone would just take the time to actually examine the facts. But guess what? T in our culture, rarely happens. The facts don't get examined. Diotrephes didn't like John's letter. He didn't like John's authority. He thought it was a, an offense to him. And so he spread malicious gossip against 
John. That's the point. And it was attack, yes, personally against John, but even more than this, it was attack, as it says, he un- unjustly accused us. I believe truly that this is the a use of what's called the ecclesiastical we, that John is speaking here of himself, but the church of whom he's writing from. He attacked us, and why did he attack the church as a whole? Because John sent a letter presumably to say, Diotrephes, I've sent to some brothers with you that need some care. They need you to take care of them. Open your, your home and your hearts to them. And Diotrephes said, no, I won't. And so they, they came back and they, they told him, similar to what Luke chapter 9 said, Jesus said to those that come to your, you come to a village and they won't receive you, what do you do? Take off your shoes and shake the dust off of your feet and go on. They, they came back and they said, John, we went there and this man, Diotrephes, he said no. The whole church says, well, how can this be? Why would he do this? Why would he refuse the gospel? His actions were attack against the work of Christ, not just against John, but he wasn't content to remain there. Look, notice what happens. He unjustly accused with wicked words and not satisfied with this. I have to say it again. Sin is never satisfied. It's never satisfied. You better be killing sin or sin will be killing you. It's that simple. This is the only options in life, guys. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ and have been transformed, if the Holy Spirit has done a work to regenerate you, you have one lot in life. It may not be a lot, but it's yours. And it's this. You now must be killing sin or sin will be killing you. You must be pursuing after Christ or you will be pursuing after all manner of everything else. Because guess what? Satan and the world and all the temptations will continue to pursue after you. Satan never rests. Sin never gives up. Temptation never quits. Diotrephes wasn't satisfied just with gossip. No, he took it a step further. Notice he refused to be hospitable. He himself does not receive the brethren either. He didn't just say, hey, John, I'm not listening to your instructions. He's like, you can't come in. Get out. This is my church. Not just a rejection of John at this point, right? This is a rejection of God and the ministry of the gospel. He's unwilling to receive these brothers who, verse 7 says that they went out. Why? For the sake of the name. What's that tell you about Diotrephes? It tells you the, the whole verse that the only name Diotrephes was concerned about was his own. That's selfish ambition. It gets worse. Then stop there. Notice. He kept others from being hospitable. It says, and he forbids those who desire to do so. I I just, I don't love this. That's not the right word. I'm I'm just amazed with this. He won't lift a finger to open the door to the brethren on his own. And now we learn he won't even allow anybody else to do it. He kept forbidding and hindering their help. The verb used here, it's common in the New Testament. It's the same verb that Jesus uses in the Gospels when he rebukes the disciples because they're trying to keep the children from coming to him. And he says, don't hinder the little ones. Let them come to me. This is what Diotrephes is doing. He's hindering the work of the Gospel. But it even gets worse. He doesn't just hinder the work of the Gospel. He doesn't just stop it himself. He doesn't just proclaim gossip and slander against John and others. It gets worse. He doesn't just say, no, you can't. He says, because you tried, get out. I think this supports the view that Diotrephes clearly had some position of power and authority, right? He's able to forbid and excommunicate those who would try to provide hospitality to those who John sent And each of the situations here in verse 10, each verb is in the the present tense. This is speaking of the fact that this is a a continual disruption by Diotrephes of the advance of the gospel. His selfish ambition has gotten in the way. And it's gotten in the way 
that it's causing harm to the church. John Stott, in this, on this text, he says this, it's so good. He says, self-love vitiates all relationships. Diotrephes slandered John, cold-shouldered the missionaries, and excommunicated the loyal believers, all because he loved himself and wanted to have the preeminence. And let me say this, I hazard a guess. In fact, I'm pretty confident that the whole time that Diotrephes was doing this, that he was defending his actions as biblical or defending his actions as right or defending his actions as necessary. You know why? Because when people love the preeminence, and by the way, there were people in his church that were obviously in agreement or at least maybe they were terrified of him. Maybe they had just not dealt with the weed when it was a little tiny weed and it had grown to such size that they needed a backhoe. And it's the first century and backhoes hadn't been invented yet. But I think sometimes we assume that, man, here's this diatrophies. He must have been just a, must have been so obvious, right? How many times do we have individuals, I, I've stopped, I've ceased trying to count. How many times can we count examples in the visible church in America where there has been diatrophies that have gotten away with it for decades and decades and decades. This is a horrible situation to read about. And it's one that we're tempted to kind of shake our head and even go, oh, gosh, I can't believe diatrophies. But I want to interrupt your internal thought for a moment. And suggest that this type of selfish ambition, this type of pride, very often lies, I would say this, it lies all the time at the root, at the heart of all dissensions and disruptions of the church today. I'm 45. I've lived half as long as some of you. You may have a a broader history of these things, but I've had the the privilege and honor to be an elder in two different churches. I've had the privilege and honor to be in ministering in multiple churches, Northern California, Southern California, right? I've had the chance to see the good, the bad, and the ugly, and I can tell you almost to a T, every single example of dissension or disunity or fighting in the body at some point can be traced back down to pride and selfish ambition. Sometimes it's just pride that we we dig in and we say, this is my position and I'm not moving. Now listen, dig in on a position if the word of God is behind you. Take the spade of the scriptures and dig into those positions. Fortify yourselves in the biblical positions. There are places and times, rightly so, where we should be very quick to recognize, as it says, that there might be even a factious man and we're supposed to deal with it. There are times when there is a place where Matthew 18 makes it clear where we do say, yes, we're going to treat you as an unbeliever because you're bringing into this body an unrepented sin and it's going to do damage to the body. And so we do that. Brothers and sisters, we have to constantly evaluate in ourselves the reality that this danger leads to deeds and it's always rooted in pride. We all need to be aware of that. We all need to take stock of it. The danger of selfish ambition is clear. The deeds are evident. There's one last point. Notice the dictum against selfish ambition. Just another word for a motto or a moral motto for us to this letter. Notice that John turns his attention back because this is really the the main point, this is in verse 11, this is the only uh, command, the only imperative in the entire letter. And it's a clear instruction back to Gaius. How do we know it's Gaius? Because verse 11 he says, beloved. That's how he's addressed Gaius from verse 1. Beloved, the one that I love in the truth. He says, beloved, do not imitate what is evil but what is good. The one who does good is of God and the one who does evil has not seen God. 
John circles around and he, he, he says, I've given you two examples. I've given you this one you've just heard about, Diotrephes, in verse 9 and 10. It's pretty clear that he's doing evil. There's a second in verse 12. He says, there's this man, Demetrius, and he's received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. And we add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. He says, he says uh, <laughs> we know nothing more about Demetrius than this verse. But notice the power of it, his reputation from everyone, from John, the church on his behalf, even from the truth itself. This is a good man. This is a man like you, Gaius. Receive him. Provide for him. Imitate him. You see, the contrast here in 3 John is, is he writes to Gaius and he says, in effect, Gaius, be careful who you copy. Be careful who you imitate. Be careful who you follow. Why? Because your character and your behavior evidences the reality and quality of your relationship with God. Let me say that again. Because your character and your behavior is going to evidence the reality and quality of your relationship with God. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? Jesus says that you can tell a tree by what? Its fruits. In John chapter 3, we hear these words, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men loved the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds might be manifested as having been wrought in God. The point is, in this statement, the reality that, yes, despise evil, knowing that imitating evil is evidence that you've not seen God. No matter what your profession of your mouth is, it's going to be evidenced by the possession of your life. You can lie with your lips, but your life doesn't lie. That's why some of you, we can come here, I know, it's easy to come to church and put on a good face and say all the right things so that no one's aware of what's actually going on in your heart. By the way, hospitality, that's one of the reasons why some of you won't have people into your home, because they might see the truth. That's why, by the way, hospitality is a requirement, a qualification of an elder. You know why? Because you must see into the truth. Are these men who whose lives exhibit that they can manage their own home or not. Truth isn't in what they say, it's in how they live. The other side as well, keep imitating the good because your love of the truth and your love of those who bears the truth is going to to do what? It's going to evidence that you're one of God's children, that you love him. That's what verse 11 is all about. Don't imitate what is evil, but what is good. Why? Because those who imitate what is good evidence that they are of God. One commentator wrote this, doing good flows naturally from the person born of God just as doing evil is a calling card of children of the devil. So let me ask you, what's your calling card say? How does your living speak about you? And we need to take heed to this dictum. This is a maxim that should guide our, lay, our lives. I think of a train upon a track. The train on the track to God does not run by the engine of selfish ambition and pride. It cannot. It won't work on that. It's not fueled by pride. It cannot. No, it's run by the engine of selfless servanthood. It's, it's fueled by the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us that motivated Motivated in us by the love of God through Jesus Christ to us. Brothers and sisters, we have to remain vigilant and sober-minded. You cannot let down your guard against pride even for a moment. If you say and think, ah, pride's in my rear view window. (laughs) It's behind me. Take heed lest you fall. Listen to this preacher who warmed well. The worm of pride is ever threatening to eat into the fruit of the Spirit in your life. The poison of pride ever sits inconspicuously on life's shelf. A little success, a little prosperity, and we're ready to burn incense to our own accomplishments. 
let the world bestow on us a few of its flatteries and we're ready to throw in the lot with it. Pride is ever beside you in the crowded highway and the lonely street. It's your constant companion, arriving early and staying late. It never leaves you night and day till death do you part. Pride is the hound of hell that can only be defeated by the hound of heaven. End quote. And what is the remedy? I've given you a lot of bad news. It's been a bad sermon. You're not supposed to laugh at that. (laughs) But what's the remedy to pride and selfish ambition? Listen, it's simple. Think less of yourself, endeavor of Christ. Fill your eyes with Christ. Less of your wants and more of his word. Less about your desires and more about his will. Less about what can be done for you and more about what you can do for Christ and others. Less about your advancement and more about the advancement of the gospel. Less about your preferences and more about his preeminence. Make much of Christ and strive daily to honor and exalt him. That's how you put pride to death. And if you find in your conversation that you're always talking about you, that you're always talking about you and what you've done and how many Bible verses you've memorized and how many times you've read through the Word of God and how many classes you've taught and how many blah, 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 blah. Pride. Boast in Christ and Him alone. What we need more of is humility, humility, humility. I read the following illustration from one of Charles Spurgeon's sermons. I almost just read you his whole sermon because it was so good. It would have been a good sermon then, not a bad one. But listen to this illustration. A little bird of the air found itself in a church. It was anxious to find its way into the open air, and so it flew aloft among the great timbers of the roof where it was half buried and almost blinded by the dust that lay thick upon the beams. There were no seeds, no fruits, no water in that dry and thirsty height. So then it made a dash at the window, glorious with many colors. But it found no way of escape. It tried again and again and again, and at last it dropped, stunned upon the pavement of the aisle. When that little bird recovered itself, it didn't again fly aloft, but seeing the door... Open upon the level of the floor, it joyfully flew through it into the open country. You're that bird. Pride makes you and I deal with the high things up in the roof. Among the lofty mysteries, you're blinding yourself. There's no escape for you there, nor rest, nor even life. You seek a way through the glory of your own painted righteousness, but this will be death to you if you persevere. Drop down upon the floor of honest confession and lowly penitence. Come to the ground by self-humiliation, and when you get lower ideas of yourself, you'll see just before you the open door who is Jesus Christ. As soon as you see him, Use the wings of a simple faith that, that leads you to liberty. No more a captive doomed to die. May God bring you down that he may exalt you in due time for Christ's sake. Let's pray. Oh God, my prayer is simple. Every single one of us in this room need an exalted view of you, Lord Jesus Christ. And every single one of us in this room, like that bird, need to drop to the floor. We need to remember that you have called us in your word to humble ourselves under your mighty right hand. You have called us to be servants of all. You've called us to give up our striving in our own strength and to rest in the strength that comes only through trusting and abiding in you, Lord Jesus. If there be any in our midst today 
who've strived in their own, whose selfish ambition and pride has kept them from seeing the door that's wide open, that has flirted and flown up in the rafters trying to find their way out through their own self-righteousness. Lord, would you drop them to the ground even now and help them to see Jesus. And Jesus, would you do that work by your spirit that you alone can do. Open up their hearts. Give them a new heart of flesh. Replace that heart of stone and help them to love you and to live for you. Give them the new birth. Give them repentance and faith, gifts that they might have new hearts and new desires. Do a work in us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.